I welcome you all to the fifth certificate course in hepatopancreatic or biliary surgery being held at our prestigious institute, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. By a team effort of eminent members of multiple specialties, we hope to introduce young surgeons to the intricacies of the rapidly growing field of hepatopancreatic or biliary surgery. For your information, we will have a small inaugural ceremony in the evening. Before proceeding with today's course, I would like to remind all the members that the course is spread over six days, evenly distributed between liver, pancreas and biliary surgery. Every session will have guest talks given by honorable faculty members. Each talk will be of 18 minutes duration, followed by seven minutes for discussion. Starting now, I would like to invite Professor Abhinash Supe, President IHPBA, to start the course by his talk on surgical anatomy of liver and its application to resection. This program is the brainchild of his efforts and his contribution to the field is unprecedented. He is currently Professor and Head, Department of GI Surgery at KEM Hospital, Mumbai. I take the course in this prestigious institution of India and Chandigarh. I really thank you for all of you for coming. This course really takes you to the from basic HPV surgery to the advanced HPV surgery and introduces you to the whole concept of what is newly coming to this particular At the outset, let me tell you this is a course, this is not a conference. So if you have any questions, please ask them, discuss these issues at this stage. We consider no question is a silly question. Because if this is something which we want you to really clarify in your mind and go back and not only start the HPV surgery at your own setup at whatever level and improve the practice and that's something at the end of this particular course. You have, we have very different kind of people from the you consult junior people to be professors and consultants and therefore we will try to see that we can turn to everybody. But if you have any questions, please, we would like to really have that clarified at this stage. And we have little lights down at this stage. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Kaushik. Now, the first talk is on liver anatomy and its application to the hepatic resection. Now, traditionally, we normally learn about the liver anatomy in a morphological way. That means it's based on the external appearance of the liver, does not show the internal features and vessels, and biliary drug branching, which are the most important aspects of any hepatic surgery. Because the most important is the functional anatomy of the liver. Especially the coenoid really went through the surgical anatomy and the liver revisited what they called it. And this is something which changed the mind in which the surgeon started really working. Actually, the concept he really brought forward is similarity of the liver is parting of absent and different vessels. The whole concept of dynamics of liver flow and two independent distributions overlapping according to the definite rules. So, liver though looks a very gross one organ, has so many compartments and they are very well organized in their own pathways functionally. Now, this was the first model which Coenard really thought and what was his intermingling with the portal vehicles along with the venous and all segments were based on that one. Now, let us first think about what is the relationship of hepatic vein. I will talk mainly not from the gross anatomy, but we will talk mainly the functional anatomy because of the time. And if you really see, we have an hepatic venous plane and we have a portal venous plane and both of them intermingle. So, at this hepatic venous plane, you have segment 2, 4, 8 and 7 at higher level, while at the lower level, you have segment 3, 4B, 5 and 6. And this is the kind of a rotation in which they will act and we will explore it little further. So what is unique about a liver anatomy? 
that two afferent vascular channels, hepatic artery and the portal vein, which bring blood. Portal vein brings almost 75% of the blood, while the hepatic artery gets about 20-25%. Three efferent channels, hepatic veins, they are the main three hepatic veins, but there are multiple other veins which it can directly go from the cordate flow into the IVC. An extremely vascular organ with rapid flow. Remember, and therefore, intraoperative hemorrhage is thus the most crucial factor in understanding this anatomy. If you understand, you can really cut it down this bleeding. Now, the hepatic veins are locus superior, they are really hanging, and the liver hangs from these veins. You may find major hepatic vein on the right, right inferior hepatic vein draining into the IVC. No other major vasculature between IVC and the liver. Now, this is again very important. At 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, there is no major vasculature. This is used when somebody does a liver hanging manual. The right and left lobes of liver are organized symmetrically on each side of the main portal fissure. And each has a paramedian sector and a lateral sector. So, there is a center. There are two paramedian sectors and there are two lateral sectors. But their whole anatomy functionally is slightly different. Having said that, let us really go into little more into deep. The left paramedian sector is the quadrate lobe. The left lateral sector is situated to the left of the falciform ligament. So, falciform ligament really divides between the lateral and paramedian sector of the left lobe. And the right layer, there is no surface demarcation between paramedian and lateral, but there are functional demarcations which are there. Because you may have 
a CT picture, but once you mobilize the right ligament, then you will have a little different. And therefore, many times an intraoperative ultrasound is extremely useful making critical decisions about the liver sections. Now, let's see, let me go further and find out what is the relationship of this. You can really say the intraoperative ultrasound, which can pick up all the three veins and they are in a different position. Now, if you really look a cut section, well, that's what we have to understand when we look at an hepatic section. If you look at a higher cut, that means this is a venous plane, hepatic venous plane. You are seeing three veins at a higher level. That means this is a left hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein and the right hepatic vein. And you are seeing the segment 2, 4A, 8 and 7. Now, if you go slightly lower at the portal vein where it is really going, you will see junction of 2 and 3, you will see 4A, 4B, you will see 8 and 7 because liver is slightly lower in that particular plane. If you go slightly lower, here you will see already the 3 is there, 4B is there, 5 and 8 is there and 6 and 7 is there and if you really take a cut at a lower level, you will see 3, 4B, 5 and 6. So, this is where the whole anatomy is there. Now, look at here, if you take a portal vein here, typically portal vein is will be there at the center and again you will see the venous anatomy which is dividing 3. So, the portal vein is in the center which is really dividing these 4 lobes. So, it is a typically, though there are 8 segments, there is a specific pattern for a surgeon to really understand this in further. Having said that, let us look at the CT anatomy and see how we really look at into every anatomy and every segment into this. Now, if this is segment 3, look at this portal vein and you are seeing a segment 3 because you are at a portal vein level, you are looking at a segment 3. If you look at 4A, classically you will see this is the left hepatic vein, this is middle hepatic vein and the portion which is in between that is a segment 4A. That means if you take a little higher cut, and you see in between the left and the middle hepatic vein, that will be a segment 4A. So, you have to really every time see a CT scan, you have to look at where is the hepatic veins, what is the level of your cut, where is the portal vein and that will probably always give you. Now, sometimes it takes little time for you to grasp it quickly, but if you really make that practice, this becomes very easy for you to understand as a surgeon when you look at a CT. Now, look at the segment 4B. This is portal vein and again you are seeing segment 4B again at that level, same level where there was a 4A, but it is at a lower level and because you are seeing at a portal vein and below. If it was veins, it would have been 4A because in between do that. If you look at below portal vein, it becomes 4B. Similarly, segment 8, if you really go segment 8, it is between the middle hepatic vein and the right hepatic vein and this is the segment 8 because it is again a higher segment which you are really looking at. Segment 7 is a lower segment again which is below the right hepatic vein and at, a, at the portal vein level. So that if you look at portal vein level and below the hepatic vein then the right hepatic vein which is segment 7. Similarly, if you really look the segment 6 it is at a lower level and segment 5 is again at a lower level near the portal vein. So, if you really look all segments, if you can really identify very well, segmental anatomy, this is 4A, this is 8, then this is 7, this is 6, 5 and 4B. Look at the veins, look at the portal are veins and then you can really make a typical judgment about what kind of a segment you are looking at when you are looking at a CT anatomy. Cordate lobe is posterior, direct connections with the IVC. There could be different kind of portal lobe, we will talk about it tomorrow. Now, once you understand this is the basic liver segmental anatomy, what next step is, how did this concept of resections came into picture? Hepatic resection is possible because of two most important aspects. One is liver is segmental in structure and secondly regeneration is possible. Even if you remove this much of liver, after 4 weeks or 5 weeks, you will get a good regeneration if the patient survives that phase. And therefore, then the concept came of really removing lobes. So, the terminologies in the beginning were quite different. People used to call lobectomies, hemi liver, 
and all that based on these particular segments. And this was the cantal line, and people used to call right hepatic tummy, left hepatic lobic tummy, and there were different terminologies which were people using. So in IHPBA Brisbane Terminology 2000, this was the terminology which was really used. The right anterior section is 5 and 8, posterior section is 6 and 7, lateral section is 2 and 3, medial section is 4, hepatic lobe means 2, 3, 4, right hepatic lobe means 5, 6, 7, 8. And their cordage lobe may be taken out depending upon the anatomy. So once you, this is the terminology which is now followed world over. And most of the time when you say, I have done a right hepatic, hepatic tummy, that means you have done 5, 6, 7, 8. And if that's the reason when we normally lock off right hepatic tummy, it is 5, 6, 7, 8 plus minus segment 1. And left is 2 to 4 plus minus segment 1. And this is what is now the terminology which is normally used. Right hepatic tummy, 5, 6, 7, 8. Left lateral segment tummy is only 2, 4, 2, 3. The less hepatic tummy is 2, 3, 4 and extended hepatic tummy when you do the 5, 6, 7, 8 and include segment 4. Now what are principles of liver resection? The first elective liver resection was done by Langen back in 1888. However, if you really look the early results of liver resection sometime in 19, up to 1977, these are from Sloan Kettering, 20% of the patients died in the operation room because of expansion hemorrhage another 14% died post-operatively and there were not very good results. However, the results if you see operative mortality, published mortality in 1977 was in the range of 25%. Partial hepatectomy for malignant disease can be rarely justified. You know, this was a kind of a concept with which we learned our whole uh, MBBS course. That time when somebody has an hepatic metastasis or a hepatic tumor, it was really left alone. We never really operated those patients during those days. That time because probably the surgery was very, very bleeding and everybody was very worried about doing surgeries in these patients. However, you must remember as the technique becomes safe, the indications expand. You know, this was the title of the editorial. I had a pleasure to write with Professor Lungard and this was something which that time the whole title was as the techniques become safe people start doing more and more kind of surgery and that has exactly has happened with hepatic resection over the last say 15 or 20 years. This branch has really grown tremendously in the last 15 to 20 years and therefore if you see the confidence of people, the way you do HPV surgery it has really changed even in our own country. Hepatic imaging has really helped. The next talk which is going to be taken by Dr. Sitaram on devices has helped also some degree. The post-operative care, understanding of anatomy and all these factors has helped you to take this further into the surgery. And therefore now doing a hepatic resection like this is very technically easy and can be done well. The most important is we now do an arterial imaging, CT, CT imaging or arterial imaging which gives us a much better arterial and portal flow. We have now software which can really exactly tell us where is the pathology. And now we can really find out this is the plane I am going to cut, how I am going to do. People use intraoperative ultrasounds. One step further, what is called as the image guided surgery. That means many times the computer will tell you that whether you are in the right plane and how close you are and the trying to avoid errors. I understand this is something which is coming up and if you realize it makes us one thing again that if you understand the anatomy well and your plan of surgery is very well probably you can cut down the complications of hepatic surgery quite low. So intraoperative ultrasound has made again uh, understanding anatomy has always been a success. The another concept which came was a Wilson's capsule, <coughs> you know Lanois. Actually we are very fortunate to have Professor Lanois in India and he gave a talk about three weeks ago in Delhi and he is a really person who developed this Lanois concept that he says that try to loop the pedicle right and left in the capsule. Many of us try to, I mean in the beginning people used to really isolate each vessel and then take a control of that. But this Glissonian concept is where you normally try to, to and that is very useful in a laparoscopic surgery. When you don't want to really do it, normally you loop the whole Glissonian. So you make a cut into the liver, 
go a little deeper into the liver and here you can take anterior or posterior pedicle separately or together and then you can do section ectomies very well. So the concept of Gleasonian capsules has made now laparoscopic surgery also equally easy. And therefore now if you really do, you take a Gleasonian capsule, you can really see the demarcation very well. You can see the segment 6 and 5 very clearly different and then you can plan your resections based on that. Now, the, a few words about anatomic versus non-anatomic resections. Anatomic resections are always preferred as have significantly less likely to have positive margins than non-anatomic resections. Because non-anatomic resection, as I said, every segment is functionally active segment in liver. That means it has its own inflow, it has its own portal biliary tract and it has its own outflow. So if you properly delineate that segment, and you remove that segment, the bleeding is going to be less. But if you cross the territories grassly, then you are going to get more bleeding, more venous congestion, more continued bleeding, and probably it will impact your results. And therefore, anatomic resections are much preferable over the non-anatomic resection. Non-anatomic resections are preferred when you want to preserve parenchyma sometimes in cirrhotics or in LCC with hepatitis, and patients who have more than two segments of functional parenchyma poorly. In fact, if you really see, one of the things which everybody must really think is what is the remnant volume we are likely to keep and that is another aspect of anatomy when you look at the hepatic anatomy. Remnant liver volume for safe hepatectomy because unless you have a remnant volume around 40% or 35% which is there, which is functional volume, you can never allow any patient to survive and therefore we are doing right extended hepatectomy or doing LDLT, you have to really remember this. Of course, there are various methods, but one of the things which we say normally say is a CT volumetric analysis. So, CT is used to do volumetric, but then it does not do the functional kind of an assessment. So, how do people really do? So, there is a now the latest tool what is called as a Limax test, and this is something which has come up in last four or five years. This is where you try to do a bedside test for determination of maximal liver function. See, in the olden days, people used to do various kinds of clearances, ICG clearance. But this is pick up, picking up in Europe where people do a C-methacetin kinetics and you normally an IV methacetin and detected by a bread test and you combine it with CT volumetry where you can predict whether this is likely to have a small for size or this is going to be a less kind of a functional liver. So you try to use anatomy and functionality to predict whether the patient is going to have an adequate volume of the liver. So that's another aspect of anatomy when you are trying to do with the liver. So to summarize, advances in imaging modalities and understanding anatomy and acquisition of the functional reserve of the liver has most essential for a hepatic surgeon. So not only you have to understand the anatomy, which is the, the functional anatomy of the liver segment which you are planning to really reset, understand the inflow and outflow, plan your surgery much more in advance. How I am going to do it on table? where I am going to ligate pedicles, where I am going to do my hepatic veins ligation, how control I am going to take. So you should have some plan. Many things may not, sometimes it may not be as per your plan, but you should have a plan based on the understanding of anatomy. Resection based on anatomy are preferred over non-anatomic resections and your softwares provide you 3D imaging of the liver and prepare surgeon a better surgeon. Now, the, I would like to end my talk with a quote by Bismuth. I am sure you have seen Dr. Rismuth, even at the age of 80, he is as young as anybody and he is still active. So his talk is, my policy is to try to resect when it is technically possible. We must try to give the patient the chance, even small, of a cure, captures the essence of the modern approach in hepatic surgery. So today, that fear of hepatic surgery has definitely gone and we are now right, trying to talk about how we can make the hepatic surgery resections more anatomical, more functional more safe to give maximum benefit to the patient. Thank you very much. Not serotic, non-serotics. 55, 60% of liver is anyway removed when you do LDLT. LDLT, when you do a live donor liver transplant. What is the problem there? Assessment is a problem. Why do people get problems after LDLT for small for size or liver failures? What is the cause of liver failure in post-operative phase in such patients? Now, if you have a large tumor, which is not, there is no functional liver and there is a small size of liver which is there, 
then usually it does not cause any problem. Why? Because the body has adjusted to that segment 2, 3, 4 or something like that. The trouble comes when you are doing an NDLG, that means when you are doing a liver transplant, when the body is functioning, when you are taking 60%, the 40% is usually enough, but that should be a good quality of liver and you should maintain the inflow and outflow. So how do you predict it? Anatomical assessment on a CT scan is one way of doing it, but also do the functional assessment. Therefore, you have to do these tests. Many times you do the good quality of liver. People do they do biopsy, but biopsy will only tell you about the fat and the quality of the liver. Functional assessment is equally important. So, 60% is commonly taken in India. You can go beyond. I mean, yeah, people go up to 70 to us. I mean, 65% also. But people are very safe with 30, 35, 85%. Nobody does in India. It's little beyond to be conservative towards 60, 65. Not really more than that. Yes. Yes. So normally you go at 11 o'clock and if there are any veins, that is the first thing you would see. After you have really lifted the liver on the right side in Makuchi, whatever their liver veins, you normally like it then, got it. And then you try to find out the thing. You can damage it if you directly go there. So, of course, that is the first thing you would do, uh, then you expose the IVC. Many times you are not able to expose the IVC unless you have ligated those veins. So, you ligate those veins and then you pass your blunt forceps to the helicopter. Yes. If we have little doubt about our anatomy, then we definitely call you. See, unfortunately, I don't know whether you have, but our institution does not have it interoperative ultrasound, but we call regular ultrasound. They have that particular probe. They don't have the T probe, but they have that uh, probe with which they are able to tell us what is the position of the vein. And then that is what many times what you require is the middle hepatic vein positions. And if you are able to get it, especially that, then we are in difficulty we call it. It's worth getting it that time. Yes. Are there any variations in portal vein or venous drainage? Uh, uh, as uh, we commonly encounter variations in biliary drainage and hepatic artery. Yeah, yeah, there could be many variations. There could be two, uh, there, there could be three veins, and instead of two pedicles, there could be a central pedicle. Then you have to really account for it before planning. And that is very important when you are doing a CT angiography or you are doing that and sitting with your radiologist team. Not only CTs, you may see on a council, really look dynamically, and then you plan your surgery. If you really do LDL, it is purely based on anatomy only. More complex is the biliary anatomy. Biliary has more variations than the portal vein variations. So, biliary anatomy, but there what people do, I mean, if there is a portal vein variation or uh, hepatic vein variation, people use grafts for anastomosis. Biliary is something where you may have to combine and put a phytoposition or stomach. All these variations you may have to do. So, you have to be, if you are trying to do complicated kind of resections today, we have to be expert in all this. But it is not very difficult. Many times you do a difficult uh, type 4 biliary structure. Don't we really go higher up and then we combine those two? So the same techniques help you in under, but understanding that anatomy is very important. If uh, one more question, uh, can you explain the concept of uh, future liver remnant and the standardized future liver remnant? As I said, uh, how do you really assess the liver function? See, olden days people used to, there's a structural and functional. Okay, structurally you are going there's a volumetry that means you, you really look at the various softwares and find out measure the volume and tell you that this is the percentage of liver which you are going to kill. So you measure as I said up to 65 percent people can go in a, a normal liver and that is what is beyond going that is always risking the patient's liver, uh, the future small for size is going to be. But more important is the quality of the liver. You will be always worried in cirrhotics doing all this. Sometimes the patients who are damaged livers because of some drugs or something you may also find it, especially post chemotherapy patients, blue liver what they call it as, you are always worried about the all this. So especially your patient who have given the chemotherapy and then you are trying to really do this. How do you really do that? For that people used to do various kinds of clearances. You know there used to be citrate clearance, antipyrin clearance which would tell you a gross liver functioning. But then people started doing ICG clearance into the Japan and all. But now currently as I said, the max test and those kind of tests which are simple bedside tests, people can really find out what is the function. Of course, you take child A, med score, everything you take into consideration. Along with that, to understand the functional one. 
and then you combine your anatomy with functional volume and you take a judgment. Ultimately, this is a judgment. And then sometimes, I mean, you try to be more conservative than more radical in these situations. And then the question comes of margins, oncological margins. For example, if it's very close to the middle hepatic vein, then you say whether I want to ligate it or not ligate it. Then people would remove that and do a bypass, add some graft or something like that. So you avoid congestion. Because see, whenever you do any liver resection, you are causing some degree of a portal hypertension. Because the blood flow is going to be same and the venous flow you are cutting down, the portal flow you are cutting down, the type of liver through which is going to be So there is some degree of a portal hypertension does occur after every liver resection. And that you have to really consider. So whenever you do major resections, the liver will look much more denser than what it was looking pre unless your flow is very maintained. And this has to be really understood, especially. Especially when you do splenectomy, then it's okay. You're cutting down a little half flow. But if you're maintaining the same flow, then probably you're going to cause a little more lactation. Mm -hmm. so, uh, my question is the segment 4 drainage, venous drainage of segment 4. Is mm -hmm. it principally drained by the middle hepatic vein or left hepatic vein? Mainly by the uh, middle hepatic vein. But the question is that if you ligate middle hepatic vein, the segment 4A will also get drained by the and then many times you have to really look at the anatomy, how close you are. If you find that you have to take middle hepatic vein, then what you do, you take a stump of the middle hepatic vein and then you try to bridge a gap, you try to find out one or two veins and then try to see, to reduce the congestion on the remaining part of the pore. In the healthy, healthy uh, now people are taking middle hepatic veins also. So That's what I was talking about. Actually, I'll just see, I have a slide, sorry for this. My next slide was on that. Can we go on the lights, please? Where you don't take the middle hepatic way, and uh, this is where you take the middle hepatic way. So both options you have, especially when you are doing NDLT. And then when you are taking a middle hepatic way, you are only going to congest that segment of 4A. So you have to really see how much you are going to congest. If there is significant amount of that segment is there, you have to provide drainage for that. You have to plan for you. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Inviting me to participate in this course, and I want to thank my young colleague Prakash Jain at home for doing all the work while I am here, and he's prepared most of the stock. Uh, I want to start off by saying that I have not been paid by any of these device manufacturers for giving this talk, and that is a disclaimer that I should start off with. Cutting liver is but bloody business. And if you can cut liver without losing blood, it's very good because the liver tolerates warm ischemia. It doesn't tolerate bleeding. If you talk to Prof. St. Fan in Hong Kong and talk about any complication of liver surgery, he will ultimately boil it down to losing blood. And he would say that if you don't lose blood during an operation, your results are likely to be good. So that's a great man talking. Venous bleeding obviously is more difficult to control than arterial bleeding. So the liver has got two sets of veins to compound the problem, both the vein and hepatic venous uh, systems. So controlling bleeding from liver is very much more difficult than otherwise. But devices do not mean that you must forget basics. It is very important to have low central venous pressure to prevent bleeding from hepatic veins. You must avoid hypothermia because it is a killer. It's one of the triad of hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. It perpetuates each other. Sound knowledge of liver anatomy, Dr. Supe has already talked to you about. And intraoperative ultrasound scan, among other things, can help you realize uh, liver anatomy, see blood vessels before they see you. So a liver surgeon cuts liver leaves behind sufficient amount of functioning liver at the end of the operation, good inflow, good outflow, with low morbidity, mortality. So we need a good device. We've all looked for various ideal situations in life. None of these exist. And likewise, I know there is no ideal device. But it's good to have a wish list. So what is my wish list for a good device? Cuts liver, 
while sparing blood vessels and bile ducts, there is no bleeding at all. The second important complication of a liver resection is bile leak and it should prevent bile leak or it should at least minimize the incidence of bile leak. The transaction line, adjacent to the transaction line, there is bound to be damage to the liver tissue and that damage should be kept as minimum as possible. For hospital administrators and heads of departments, the equipment must be cheap, must be easy to maintain, should not break down constantly and your annual maintenance contract should be as low as possible. Is there such a device? There is such a device. Uh, a Kelly clamp is a very simple device and it works in most situations. So why are we talking about devices? We are talking about devices mainly because about 15-20 years ago, laparoscopic revolution came into place, laparoscopic major liver resections started and Kelly clamps could not be used for this particular branch of surgery. So industry became inter interested and we have a lot of devices to play with. Three main classes of devices. First one is the device that works exactly like the Kelly principle, it just crushes blunt trauma to tissue. Second one creates coagulation of the tissue so that you can cut it safely. And the third one are stapling devices that we use in luminal surgery. The most popular, most well known blunt trauma device, if I can call it that, is a QSA the Cavitron ultrasonic aspirator, the water jet aspirator is a relatively new device and of course you know harmonics calculable from Johnson & Johnson by the aggressive marketing. Coagulation necrosis, you can use diathermy either monopolar or, or bipolar. Radio frequency energy has also been used in these devices, the Habib is the most famous of these, the stapling devices. So let's look at each one of these in a little, little bit of detail and see what we are going to use for our particular situation, our particular practice. Um, QSA principle is that it uses ultrasonic waves and because the cells contain water, it, uh, it explodes the hepatocytes, uh, leaves behind only the bile duct and the artery and vein, portal vein in the portal triad and the hepatic veins also. The hepatic veins are more easily injured than the portal vein drive. So that is something that you must be careful about. This emulsified uh, liquid is aspirated away and the uh, bleeding structures and the bile ducts are spared from your dissection. There are two sets of hand pieces available. The 24 is very much more powerful so you have to use it in a more controlled fashion. That is also used in neurosurgery. So that is something that you can think about when your machine breaks down. The advantage of QSA is that it is a single hand piece, there is no changeover and you get good visibility during the operation and the surrounding collateral damage is very very low. So this is touted as one of the advantages in preventing or minimizing the incidence of bile leaks in these patients. Disadvantage, the main machine and the consumables are prohibitively expensive, they are fragile got to look after them very carefully, you need to have a dedicated team that will look after them. And the aspiration channel is quite narrow. So one way of getting around this aspiration channel which is narrow is to suck water periodically as you are doing the uh, resection. So that it keeps flushing away the uh, debris which, is, which can collect and block the aspiration channel. Water jet is a relatively new entrant. Um, the technology is not new, uh, it is fairly simple technology, uh, you create water at very high pressures to come through a narrow jet and that was used to cut sheet metal to use in orthopedic surgery before it came on to liver surgery. It is very precise, there is no heat, there is very little collateral damage um, but the pressure has got to be adjusted for liver otherwise it will cut through the blood vessels also and, and become the operation can become quite bloody. Disadvantages are that it is expensive, it is difficult to maintain and there is absolutely no hemostatic action, only dissection is provided by the device. Harmonic scalpel, I probably do not have to tell you much about this. Um, it uses vibration, high frequency vibration to uh, coagulate and cut tissues uh, by protein denaturation 
It's very versatile. Uh, most procedures, laparoscopic, open, uh, it's very versatile. Many probes are available. There's not much collateral damage on either side, so less incidence of septic complications. Diathermy, monopolar diathermy, not very useful. Usually used only to mark the line of dissection that you're going to do after you've got the, uh, the distinction between uh, the two lobes or the segment that you're going to take out, the line of demarcation. And uh, so attempts have been made to use bipolar diathermy. Ligosure is mainly a bipolar device, but now they added on monopolar also to that um, device components, it, it, it can close vessels up to 7 millimeters. Advantages of ligature, it's stated to be better than harmonic scalpel because it can close vessels uh, larger than what harmonic scalpel can do. Can do. Um, there are multiple uh, options available as far as settings are concerned, but the big advantage is that you've got one device that will do everything. You don't need additional clips, uh, cutting, and so on. Disadvantages, uh, for us, the disadvantage is the cost. Um, it is ineffective in cirrhotic patients that, that is uh, being challenged by many papers now which are using ligature even in cirrhotic patients. It is expensive and it is not very good if, if your current supply is fluctuating. So you need a very good UPS system. And if your UPS system is not good, you're going to have problems in the function of this during your operation. Uh, transcollation, it's, it's known as aquamantis or tissue link. Uh, this is a device which delivers radio frequency ablation at the end of a, a saline jet. Um, whenever these guys have come to demonstrate this in our hospital, uh, they've always run into a lot of technical problems. I have, I have somehow got uh, not, not very good vibes about this particular device. Um, it is it is relatively new. It's not as popular as the other devices. It can it can be used as a spray mode on your uh, cut surface to, to take off the uh, uh, bleeding from small small blood vessels. It can close small duct tubes, um, and a second instrument is not necessary. Uh, but as I said, it's a relatively new technology and there probably is a learning curve both for the manufacturers and for us. Radio frequency ablation, um, I am somehow not convinced that this is a good way to go. This, this in my opinion, is uh, uh, liver resection for dummies. Uh, if you really don't know what, what, what needs to be done, you just cut through one, one plane. Uh, it chars everything in that in that area. You can cut whatever you want. You can cut big fatty veins also. Uh, somehow doesn't sound very good. Um, now a fully automated probe is available. Uh, it, it, it senses, recognizes what's happening in the tissue and shuts off automatically. Um, but it, it is expensive, very expensive. Especially the probes, the consumables are very expensive. Staplers, uh, fire three rows of staplers on either side. Uh, routine use of staplers for major liver resections, not yet very popular. Uh, we don't have that quality of staplers as yet, but things may improve with time. Uh, as of now, not useful for routine liver resection, except to staple um, vascular, major vascular pedicles in, after you've done some kind of crushing. So what is the evidence recommend? Evidence, there are, there are numerous studies uh, comparing a lot of device types. Most of the uh, evidence is uh, one device type against any classes. Most have reasonably small numbers and as always operator preference has a strong uh, influence on the results. Now if you look at the most important thing as far as the device is concerned, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to cut liver safely without bleeding. So bleeding is, a, is an important uh, uh, parameter to analyze. Other things are operating time, ergonomic advantage so that we don't get wrist problems, uh, bile leakage, uh, transfusion requirements and so on. The Hong Kong group have shown CUSA reduces blood loss. Uh, up to 30% of you know, blood loss reduction. 
with a small increase in operating time. But they are real die-hard QSA users. So it could be because they are very good at it. It could be because they have a strong bias towards QSA. But there are other groups which have got equally good results with Kelly classes. So it's difficult to say. Harmonic and radio frequency ablation versus Kelly classes. No difference in transmission requirement, no difference in bile leak rates or operating time. And Kelly crisis comes out ahead in many of these studies. Important thing, the operator is very important. Uh, basic principles are very important. And the basic principle will still remain good inflow control. Anatomical dissection is much better than non-anatomical dissection as Dr. Supre pointed out. Low CVP is absolutely important and you must exclude or control by leak at the end of the operation. I like this slide a lot because it says use one method and stick to it. Two big giants in liver surgery, uh, Les Blomgart and Professor Makuchi in Japan, they use calyclises. Um, and it's good to know how to do calyclises because your, your very fancy device which you bought for half a crore might, do, might malfunction during the operation. So operation still has got to be completed. You can't stop the operation because, because of the malfunction. If you are in Tamil Nadu, electricity is a huge problem and that, that your UPS may give up, that may be a problem. Uh, if you work in a setup like I do where patient affordability is a big problem, we deal with only lower middle class, middle class patients, that could be a problem. And lastly, I like this line a lot. Your junior may tell you, how do I do this in my setup? Please teach me. You've got to teach him. So you must know how to do any classes. Thank you. Most of their patients are sick. They have vertical transmission of hepatitis B in spite of a very aggressive immunization policy. Uh, most of their patients are sick. Most of the Transplanting, those like to use the KUSA. And if you really see, most of the centers would use either KUSA or hydrogen for dissection because they are always worried about bile leaks when you do an harmonic thing. Now, when laparoscopy came, laparoscopy does not have a KUSA. So, if you see, most of the laparoscopic surgeons will use the harmonic carpet because, as you, as you rightly said, the KV crisis is not there. Uh, now, we have laparoscopic KUSA probes as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. So in insufflator and the, uh, the suction also works only during the time that it is against something. So the probe itself is, is quite a fancy probe. But laparoscopic QSA probes are available. Sir, what is your practice of doing, I mean, uh, resection, liver resection? Yeah, we use a QSA. And one question which comes to my mind, will QSA not reduce the liver volume? In, if we use it in like LDLG, it will reduce what I it will reduce some of the liver volume by sucking. If you do it with KD, the liver taken will be larger as compared to be taken by the user. No, no, that's not true. Uh, if you if you are saying that because you are sucking, you are sucking in a very small plane. It's probably less than a millimeter in their practice because of uh, you know, low collateral damage with QSA. Uh, so that's not true. Um, yes. Yes, definitely. Um, that is something that, that adds to the dimension of laparoscopic liver resection. See, you have hepatic veins which um, are opening directly into the inferior vena cava, a valveless system. If you get a major hole in a hepatic vein during laparoscopic liver resection with the pneumoperitoneum, the risk of uh, air embolism is very significant. That is, that is a challenge, that's why you are there. Sir, another expression is that how do you stop? Sir, not understand how do you 2x, 4x, what does it mean? It just puts four probes into the liver, and then, and then and then it uh, uh, 
provides a charge, a radio frequency charge on that, and everything in that area is is uh, coagulated. So you do uh, three or four like that, and you just cut. Uh, it really is hepatectomy for dummies. Thank uh, you. So once again, I would like to invite Professor Vinash Sutte for conservative management on the Conjection or liver bleeding, we can always take in the discussion because Dr. Raprasad is was supposed to come today because of his mother's angioplasty, he is not able to really come. He will come tomorrow, that time he will cover. But if you have any other questions, we can discuss them at the end of these two talks. So for the hydratic cyst, we will have two talks. I will be talking mainly on the non-operative management, the, chem the, the chemotherapy and the care. And uh, Kaas is going to talk on to the radical surgery. But if you, at the end, we will take questions. We will see what is the standard management role. Uh, can we have little lights down? The management of liver. As I said, I will begin with some few aspects of hereditary cyst. And then I will talk about the non operative Now, the word hereditary is well known from 4th century BC from Hippocrates. And actually, kind of opulence in Greek means hedgehog berries. So actually, this word came from Europe with the kind of berries they thought, and the hydrated kind of those typical. And hydrated Latin means watery vesicles. So these are the two probably etiologies for this word hydrated, which has been talked about. Now the causative agents in our country are the kind of the granulosis. Most of these others we don't see in our country, and most of us are aware of this particular cycle and therefore I won't go into those details. Now hydratic disease has its own problems. It is a slow growing, asymptomatic. Many of these patients don't even come to us for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years before they really get some kind of symptoms. Symptoms depend on size and site, both whether the bile duct is involved or not. Mass effect that is rupture and infection, obstruction of cholangitis grow at 1 to 5 centimeters per year, okay? And this is something which uh, they would normally go into that particular. Frequently symptomatic, especially right low in 60 to 65 percent, usually more than 10 centimeters before they become symptomatic. And the common things are biliary colic, jaundice, pressure effects and infection. Now biliary colic is about 10 to 15 percent. That means about 15 percent have had it in biliary community and pressure effects and infection which are there. Now, hereditary disease is diagnosed mainly by imaging. Plain x-ray was once upon a time used, but today sonography is the most important. CT gives you much better understanding and serology usually confirms the diagnosis. Sonography is about 90 to 95% sensitive. It's anarchic smooth round cyst. And doctor says, hereditary sand, and collapsing flattened elliptical cysts which are ina inactive and calcification. So it's a range of sonography which we can really see. And therefore, based on this sonography, the first classification which really came, which was called as the Garabi classification, which was one of the what was went on for many years, and it really said type one is pure flame, type two is fluid with split wall, type three is a daughter cyst, type four is a heterogeneous echo and type 5 was calcified system. But then the WHO really developed based on the size and age of the diagnosis it developed and then it further developed into what is called as the WHO working group 2003 classification. And then divided into CE1 that is unilocular fluid field stage. <coughs> Secondly, 2 is the growth of a daughter cyst. Then 3A is a detached endocyst. 3B is predominantly solid with a daughter cyst and 4 and 5 are solidification. So C1, 2 were classified as an active cyst and 3 was intermediate while 4 and 5 were inactive cysts. So that's the way WHO really developed these guidelines. So the working group classification which is now being really followed for analyzing various therapies which are done for these diseases. CT is highly sensitive best for size, site and number. If you are able to analyze where is the size, what is its relation with the veins, with the bile duct, probably you can get it better. It images infection and rupture better than a sonography. If there is a rupture of the split, a wall, 
or there's an infection with the increased density, you can really pick it up well. And MRI is also equivalent, but CT is also really good. There is not much of difference between MRI and CT. Unless you want to look for the biliary communication, then probably you may do MRCT or an ERCT or a contrast. ERCT is also useful at times when you want to detect the biliary communication or sometimes the, the cyst or the endocyst really ruptures into the bile duct. That time you can really get this investigation. Serology is mainly for the diagnosis and follow. That means 80 to 85 percent of liver and 65 percent of lung lesion tests are positive. A number of serological tests are described. The age-old Cassoni test has a little clinical value today. Most of us have stopped doing a Cassoni test. But ELISA is more sensitive. IgG ELISA is more sensitive. And I am sure there is a specific place for you know block for confirmation. And perfumous aspiration only at the last resort because it has its own risks of anaphylaxis. What is the clinical pattern, especially all over the world? If you really look at the world, there are some countries where this is very common, grazing areas. And uh, many series have come from the Turkey and all those areas. Now, if you really look in our own country as well as outside, the mean age is 55. Though the, you can get cysts, because as I said, it takes about 10, 12 years before the patient can really come. You will always see it after 30. Very rarely you will see the hydrated cysts in a very young patient of 13 or 14. Male equal to female, abdominal pain is the main complaint when people come to you. As I said, the biliary is about 10 to 15 percent. Jaundice is 14 percent and asymptomatic at 11 percent. Mass and abdominal pain are the commonest symptoms. And because these are vague symptoms, many times they are treated for something. But with the sonography today, probably the detection has become better in our country. Now, what is the treatment you normally can really think? observe asymptomatic or calcified cysts. If you see a complete calcified cyst or a symptomatic small cyst, people can really observe it or treatment. And a symptomatic cyst definitely, you can think about the medical therapy with surgery or with pair. And that is what is today currently being really tried. Now what are principles of treatment? Medical treatment, you usually monitor with sonography and serology and if necessary do surgery or pain. Now chemotherapy has been definitely improved the outcome into these patients like say albendazole that is WHO <coughs> normally you give 10 milligram per kilogram in two divided doses for 28 days three such cycles with a gap of 20 days. This is again as I said WHO recommended therapy. Mebendazole also has been recommended but nobody really uses it today. Praziquintal is more effective in combination with the albendazole and people many times use albendazole and praziquintal because they have different mechanisms of action and many times have a complementary effect rather than they can be used on their own. Chemotherapy is mainly used as adjuvant. Albendazole is the most commonly used drug. Four days to one month before and one to three months after surgery. Now this is something where there is a lot of uh, literature is divided whether you want to give 4 days or 1 month. Most of us will give about 2 or 3 weeks before you really give them this before you surgery. If you have a large system, there is a likely spillage which is likely to occur. And you want those cysts to really be inactive before you really take them surgery because the spread is biggest. And let me tell you many times when you are doing a laparoscopic also, that time also you can really get all this. And therefore you would like to really have this. And albendazole is more effective, 10 to 15 milligram kilogram per day and uh, 3 to 6 months, 4 weeks and 2 weeks off and usually well tolerated. Now it has its own toxicity, it is mainly reversible hepatotoxicity and avoids liver disease, bone marrow separation and monitor LFT and monitor drug levels. There are other new drugs which are also coming, praziquantel. However, outcome of a medical therapy if you really look, radiological improvement is in 75 to 85 percent on albet as well. Degenerative changes occur in cyst, 25% relapse on stopping the drug and that's one another drawback. Liver cyst, doctor cyst and older patients relapse more and cysts disappear in only in 30%, reduce on 30 to 50% and unchanged in about 20 to 40%. So this is what is the current 2008 reports which really tell us that this is what is the outcome of an 
medical treatment after they were giving only albendazole to the patients. But Dr. Kuru really made a landmark kind of an improvement in our country and he's actually he did a lot of studies but his landmark study was NEJ in 1997 and that's time he introduced this pair related compared to surgery for hepatic hydratic cyst. And uh, actually he really, if you really go through with this, introduced this, the whole technique of pair technique in hydratic. And uh, in what they normally do, if you really look at Dr. Kuru, what he really did. Initially, the needle puncture in the hydratic was always avoided, never tried, that's what it was always said. Everybody was worried puncturing and uh, kind of hydratic But he introduced this concept of in mice, hydratic in mice, and unstained to stain. And then he said that, okay, we can not only puncture, and you introduce a needle, and then you allow that to collapse. And then the whole thing collapses at one month and three months. And then he produced his first paper of economical diagnosis system liver management by patronus drainage. And this was a landmark paper, but this was more of a case series. And therefore, he did later on a heat trial. So, what do they do in pair? Albendazole coverage, cysts are punctured under sonography or CT guidance, either with a needle or with a catheter according to their size. Anesthetics has to be mandatory. Whenever you are doing this case, even if it is a simple puncture, you do it with proper theatre, proper kind of a control, the patient needs to be resuscitated in case. Aspirate small quantity microscopic examination for live scolysis. If they come positive, then aspirate fully. After aspiration, exclude biliary possible connection, connection by either contrast injecting it directly into this or if you have some yellow body or you can do preoperative ARCP to do this that there is no connection. If no connections are evident, inject hypertonic saline or ethanol. They studied all the, because anaphylaxis was one of the main fear in everybody's mind. So overall fatality rate due to the lethal analysis was very low. Two out of 5,943 procedures and 5,517 cysts. So it was very low. So if you take proper care, anaphylaxis can be very less. Where is the problem? Most of the people who have developed reactions have over injected. That means the biggest mistake for people is to do it, they used to open a head at it and they used to really inject and they used to cause increased pressure into that particular head at it system. And that is to cause rupture. And therefore today this the sequence is very important. You first aspirate and completely that is the real anaphylaxis avoidance. Then you inject and then you again re-aspirate. So there is no increase in the pressure. So that is what has really reduced the incidence of anesthesis, uh, the anaphylaxis. So in pair, if you really see you under ultrasound guide, you normally would like to pass a needle. And then after one month, you will see a collapse kind of incidence. It won't disappear immediately, but it would collapse and it will become a flat like this. No positive responses, how do you really judge the response? Positive responses include both a decrease in the cyst size and a progressive change in the echo pattern, general solidification. And reserve pair for use in highly specialized centers where teams are, are well prepared to deal with the possible complications. And that is something which you would like to really see. And if you really look at the outcomes of any GM trial which was there, and that was some RCT which was done, if you really look at the patients, both were same number of patients, same kind of a hospitals, they were less with the pair compared to the surgery, mean diameter of the cyst was uh, same, disappearance of the cyst was higher, and then if you really see the complications were much less compared to the surgery, and that was the kind of an value and that's the reason which came that okay pair is better and that was the concept introduced in 1997 and if you really look at long term follow up with this the pair and surgery has practically the same kind of assist that pair involved in fact we find that drainage has much better compared to the surgery and that is what the disappearance of the cyst which was really shown WHO did further studies and that was the time when you really see 795 cases 15 percent complications 0.5% anaphylactic shock, 0.1% there, two patients needed surgery, and 1.6% recurred. Now, this is the WHO data. As I said, 
the overall data may be with the selected patients. Now, what is the outcome of pair? As I said in the systematic review, they had properly done trials in which 95% had used ethanol, 25% uh, ethanol or 25% hypertonic saline. ERCT before pair was done in most of the patients. Either they took CE1 or CE3A, 77% had some obliteration, 11.6% required second pair. And this is what a systematic review. That means mostly more than 75% of patients today are able to daily take care of them. Though there are little variable reports and the ranges differ, once you say systematic review probably has given you the sensor, no serious complications have been reported after that. Indian experience is also important. Dr. Agrawal's paper actually got published in the Journal of Gastric Surgery 2011. They had 128 patients, pair, pair D, that is uh, pair drainage that is in 52, radical external surgery in 61 and conservative surgery and this is in 33 cases. And if you really see, this is of course a surgically uh, surgeon presenting a paper but it is an Indian experience which is very well centered and pair pair is reserved for more favorable cases of type 1 and 2 cells while the others are best managed surgically. So if you really look at the trend, if you have C1, C2 or C3A, you would like to probably do pair but if you have little bigger sizes then probably you can do. Complete excision or radical excision of cystoperistotomy is going be done in 61 out of 94 patients and long term good results but hazardous senses located those to the major video vascular channel. So that means this uh, radical surgery can have its own complications when you really come close to the major vascular region. Probably I am missing even if you do say pair may not be possible in such patients because there could be really communication with these patients. So these are very definitely difficult patients but if you have some stratification and you are trying to use approach based on what is the anatomy, what is the kind of size and what is the status, probably you would get the best results in an hereditary disease. Now in summary, non-operative management of hereditary is safe and successful in early cases. Selection of cases and UHG control is essential for successful care. And uh, if we have time, I am sure after he presents, if you want, we can go on to the the conservative surgery and laparoscopic surgery for hereditary okay. We will have this talk and then we can have questions.